Walpole, my name is Ellen Curran, and I am your host for Walpole Green. Our goal is to present to you programs focused on the effects of climate change and what we can do about it. I am a member of Walpole Green. Walpole Green is a group of Walpole citizens dedicated to a healthy environment and achieving 100% renewable energy. We believe in protecting our resources and work to address the climate crisis in Walpole, our state, our country, and the world. Today, we are at the Blue Hill Observatory and Science Center in Milton, meeting with Don McCasland, who is the program director. He started part-time in 1999 when the Science Center opened and has been a full-time employee since the year 2000. Prior to that, he owned Kites of Boston at Faneuil Hall Marketplace. There was a family connection to the observatory. In the 1940s, Don's father was an observer and radio operated at the Blue Hill Observatory. This is where his parents met. It was his dad who introduced him to the atmospheric science, including items like crepuscular rays. Don perpetuates the um, science history at Blue Hill by teaching students how to build and fly their own kites and also teaching interns how to use kites for meteorological observations. Now let's go meet Don. Hi Don, and thank you very much for allowing us to be here today. I was just wondering, can you give us a history of the observatory? Sure. The observatory is the oldest continually operating weather observatory in all of the United States. It opened on February 1st, 1885, and it's been going nonstop every single day since then. It started by a man named Abbott Lawrence Roach when he was just 24 years old. He owned and operated it until 1912, when he unfortunately died of complications from appendicitis. He deposed it to Harvard, who ran it until 1959, and then the National Weather Service ran it from 1960 until 1999. And then in 1999, our private nonprofit called the Blue Hill Observatory and Science Center took over the operations, and we hope to keep it going for many centuries into the future. That's great. Um, how are you um, funded? So we, as a nonprofit, get funding from many, many different sources. We have a contract with the National Weather Service. We are a member-based organization, so membership dues help support us. A lot of our members give additional donations beyond their annual due, which is also very valuable. We have a small gift shop that's here in this kite shed right now while we wait for the renovations on the building to be completed. Income from all the sales in the gift shop help support our operations. And then we also do a lot of fee-for-service uh, activities, whether it's a tour for the general public or one of the many educational programs that we offer. Can you tell us something about these um, displays here? Sure, so the kite shed, um, this is a new shed that was built in 1999 in the exact same location of the original shed, uh, which was built in the 1890s. And kites were used to lift a tool called a meteorograph to study the uh, atmosphere at higher altitudes, as high as 15,793 feet above sea level. And the meteorograph measured the temperature, the humidity, the altitude, and sometimes the wind speed. And we learned a tremendous amount about how the weather changes with altitude as a result of the kite studies. And then later on in the 1930s, we were instrumental in the development of the radio sonde, better known as weather balloons. Oh, great. Um, can you tell us some of the things, uh, a little bit more about what you just said about about what the instruments do and uh, how sure. it's important? So, regarding the instruments here, um, in this display mm -hmm. we have the tool called the meteorograph, which is this tool right here, and the meteorograph um, writes what the different sensors measure. So one is measuring temperature, that's the thermal part of its name, Another measures the humidity, that's the high grow part of its name. And then the barometer, uh, which measures atmospheric pressure, changes with altitude, and that's how the instrument figures out the height that it is at. Are there more instruments around the facility that we could look at? Absolutely. We have a whole, what we call the instrument enclosure, and we can head over there now. So one of the most important things about Blue Hill Meteorological Observatory is we study and measure the weather the same way today as we have since February 1st, 1885, when we opened. 
So for example, this right here is a glass thermometer that has mercury in it. It's called a maximum thermometer. The way it works, it pushes a little pin up as the temperature goes up. Um, and when the temperature goes down, the pin stays at the highest point it got pushed to. So we're able to see what the highest temperature for the prior 24 hour period was. And then this one is called the minimum thermometer. It's filled with alcohol so that it has the proper viscosity for this instrument to work. When the temperature goes down, the pin gets pulled down. When the temperature goes up, the alcohol is able to flow past the pin. So we can see that the highest temperature for the previous day was what the lowest temperature was and what the current temperature is. And we make our observations out here three times a day, 7 a.m., 10 a.m., and 1 p.m. Um, and we're looking at the current temperatures at those three times and what is the maximum to that point and what is the minimum to that point. Generally, the minimum is right before dawn and generally the maximum is in the middle of the afternoon around 2 to 4 p.m. depending on the season. And uh, that's all in standard time, not daylight savings time. And we keep track of the um, time of what time the highest temperature occurred and what time the minimum temperature occurred with this tool called a high growth thermograph. The high growth thermograph is very similar to the kite meteorograph in that it has uh, two sensors on it. The um, humidity sensor uses real human hairs. When it's really humid, the hair will curl and tighten and move the needle to a high point. And as the air dries, the hair straightens and relaxes and the needle goes to a lower point. Um, and then the temperature sensor is two different types of metal and because the metal expands and contracts at different rates, it will move the needle up or down accordingly to the uh, current temperature. So that it tells us whether we're having a rapid change in temperature or a gradual change in temperature for each day, um, what the maximum was and the time of the maximum. And by having the multiple instruments, we're able to make sure they're all accurate. Ideally, the maximum that this instrument recorded will match the maximum that the high growth thermograph recorded, and the same thing with the minimum. So have you seen changes in the um, temperature ranging ranges over the past years? Yes. Compared to, it is to what it is today? Right. So one of the things about climate change mm -hmm. is that it's the trends. It's what's different now than in the past. And we have seen a definite trend of warming temperatures um, using round numbers in the first century from 1820 to 1920, uh, we had about a one degree increase. And from 1920 to 2020, we've had about a two degree increase here at Blue Hill, and that's all in Fahrenheit scale. Um, so we've seen a definite increase here with the most recent century going up twice as fast as the prior century. Okay. And what effect has it had? Some of the ones that are most noticed are invasive uh, or disease, for example, the woolly adelgid that affects the hemlocks. They get killed off by frost. Well, with warmer temperatures, we're having less frost and less low temperature, so they're able to migrate much farther north than their usual range, and so that's affecting the hemlocks. Mm. Um, and there's other changes uh, that we are noticing. One of the things we've kept track of here at Blue Hill since 1885 is the date of the first ripe blueberries. And the blueberries are ripening earlier than they used to. And though it's had a minimal impact so far, if the food starts ripening at different times than the animals that rely on those foods, then their life cycle is going to be affected and they may not feed properly and uh, that could have an impact. So we see a disruption in the balance of nature. That is correct. Yeah. We monitor it several ways here at Blue Hill. In addition to keeping track of the first ripe blue, uh, blueberry, which is a type of uh, climate science known as phenology, we also keep track of the freezing and thawing of the ponds, both Houghton's Pond and Ponkapog. And they are freezing much, much later in the year uh, and thawing much earlier. So the length of time that there's ice on the ponds is much shorter. And that affects the life cycle and the oxygen cycle within the ponds and water there, so that's an impact uh, also. Don, can we look at some of the other displays here? Sure, we have a wide range of working instruments. So this is another example of using the same tool and the same technique for the entire period of record from 1885 through today. It's called a standard gauge rain gauge. This ring of flaps around the outside prevents the wind from blowing the precipitation across the gauge to get a false low measurement. The wind hits the flaps, creates turbulence out here, Inside the circle, there's no wind, so the precipitation can fall straight down into the gauge. It has this funnel, and the funnel goes into this tube, 
The area of this circle is exactly 10 times larger than the area of this circle, so we can be very precise in our measuring. Every one one hundredth of an inch of rain that goes in here becomes one tenth of an inch deep in the tube. So our ruler is in tenth of an inch increments, but it's measuring one one hundredth of an inch increments of precipitation. So very precise, and yet it's also very accurate because it's so simple. Just a funnel and a tube and a ruler. And this is probably the most popular um, rain gauge among both cooperative observers who are citizen scientists that set up stations in their backyard and share weather data with the Weather Service, as well as professional observatories like us and Mount Washington Observatory also uses the standard gauge rain gauge. So what have we learned from using this instrument? Well, the most important thing about using this, what we call homogeneous data, same tool, same technique, same location, is those trends whether it's the temperature trend or the precipitation trend, we know that everything we're seeing, it's truly the weather that is changing. It's not because the instrument's measuring different, it's not because the location is different, it's not because the method is different, because all of those things are the same. The only thing that's different is the weather, and we are seeing uh, different trends. Our precipitation is actually slightly increasing, even though we've just come off of a drought for 2022, um, um, overall, when you look at the longer trend, the amount of precip is increasing, and that's another indicator of the climate change because the amount of water vapor, there's more water now um, than there was 100 years ago. Okay, and how does that affect our environment? Well, it depends on where you are because just like we're getting an increase in precipitation here in uh, the Massachusetts and pretty much all of New England, in other parts of the world, they're getting a lot less and so deserts are expanding and growing and um, so it depends on where you are in the world what the impact of the changing precipitation trends are. And how about here in New England? So here we're not seeing um, any definitive differences with the precipitation. It's only a slight increase not enough to. We're not having flooding, for example. It's not like we're going from regular rain, although we are noticing a change in the quality of precipitation. We're getting a lot more extremes where it'll be really, really, really dry for quite a while, and then we'll have torrential rain as opposed to a nice, long, 24-hour gentle rain. Mm. And so we are noticing the uh, quality of the rain is changing. And torrential rain does not get absorbed by the earth as well, so we get a lot more runoff, which contributes to erosion, and a huge amount of the water ends up going out into the ocean rather than into the aquifers. So the water table is not necessarily replenishing as well as it should, mm. even if the numbers are good. It doesn't necessarily mean the quality of precipitation is good. Okay, all right, and you have other instruments. Yep, so to make sure we know the trends that I was just talking about, we have a tool here called a weighing gauge rain gauge, and it physically graphs and records the precipitation as it falls. So we know what the rate for each hour of rain is, uh, and the quantity for each hour so that we can distinguish between that nice gradual 24 hours with a tenth of an inch each hour for 2.4 for the day versus two in an hour, two inches in an hour. Um, and this graphing tool here can tell us that. Okay, and has that resulted in any changes in our climate? Has that shown any changes because of that? Well, those extremes that I was talking yeah. about earlier regarding the torrential rain mm -hmm. versus nice long durations, even though our overall precipitation uh, might be very similar or slightly higher, the type of rain is dramatically different. And in all precipitation, snow as well. Yeah, so that's another type of precipitation gauge. This is called the tipping bucket gauge. And the tipping bucket is one of our more modern tools. The rain goes through the funnel into this little thing here. When it gets full, it tips and it dumps out. And then each side, at the time it tips, it sends a message to a digital recorder so that we know um, how much rain we got. And again, the computers that the tipping bucket rain gauges talk to can record the rain for every hour, uh, as well as the totals for each day. We total up the totals for each day for the month. We also do seasonal and annual totals. 
Okay. Are there any other instruments that are more modern or updated? Or? So another very modern one is this tool right here. Uh, the Davis Vantage Pro 2 is a very popular um, weather station for amateurs and professionals. Um, very high quality data, but easy to install for your backyard uh, weather station. And this is the tipping bucket rain gauge here with the tipper right here. And then in here is a hygrometer measuring humidity, thermometer measuring temperature, barometer measuring pressure, as well as a solar radiation uh, measure. And then this is also connected to an anemometer and a vane doing wind speed and wind direction. So fancy modern electronic equipment working right alongside the long-term homogeneous equipment we've used since the 1880s. So what do you learn, what do you know about when you look at the radiation, when it measures the radiation? What so do, for this tool, you? it's measuring the amount of sun in watts per meter squared. And that would be valuable for uh, green energy such as solar power. Are we getting more sun now than we used to, or are we getting less sun now? Uh, the sun amount is actually one of the few things that's been pretty steady, averaging 52% of bright sunshine here at Blue Hill. So, um, who takes advantage of this information um, and that's gathered in? How is it used? So, our data is shared with a huge range of scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, the National Weather Service uh, regional office in Norton also has the Northeast Regional uh, River Forecast Center. And so the hydrologists in the River Forecast Center are very, very interested in all of our rain data um, because how the water is flowing is going to affect uh, pond levels and the aquifers and the lakes and even going out into the ocean. And because of the flow of the water, Massachusetts Marine Fisheries wants to know what the precipitation is doing so that they can keep track of things like do they have to worry about flooding in the clam flats uh, or do they have to worry about pollution from rivers going out into the ocean or other impacts that could affect the fishing and shellfish industries. And then we have the climatologists who are looking at the long-term trends and what we are experiencing and they want to um, know and keep track of the differences and whether things are happening more rapidly now uh, than they used to and the answer is yes they are uh, as i mentioned earlier with yeah. the temperature two degrees in the most recent century one degree in the prior century we're seeing the trends in wind speed dramatically dropping especially since the 1980s and the precipitation trend is a gradual increase in precipitation overall have the fishermen been able to use this information that they received to plan ahead so that um, it's you know a better environment for the fish and better for the fishing for them? So the water regarding the fish I was mm -hmm. talking about is on a daily basis. Okay. It's not for planning purposes. Okay. Um, but the torrential rains are something they have to worry about more because torrential rain is going to impact the clam flats and other areas like that more so uh, than a nice gentle rain will. So recognizing that we are having torrential rain more often than we used to does impact them and they can plan accordingly. So with all this information that you receive, how can we as individuals use this information to help provide or create a cleaner environment? Well, there's many different impacts. Uh, probably the most important is to just be aware and mm -hmm. recognize that climate change is real. We have all kinds of data that's reinforcing it. Uh, we can't talk about global warming at Blue Hill because we are only one site, but all the records that we have and all these trends that we're seeing here at Blue Hill can be reinforced by other sites like ours around the world in both hemispheres, and those trends are true. And so recognizing that climate change is real and that the rates are differing, maybe we can uh, act accordingly to both mitigate such things as marshland and other efforts to protect the coastlands and deal with the rising sea levels, as well as seeing about controlling and possibly reducing greenhouse gases and by doing things such as using re use renewable sources for example, solar power and the data we get from the sunshine mm -hmm. recorders help deal, protect and recognize solar power 
And then we also have all kinds of wind data. Our data was used by the folks at Hull, where they have two very good, very productive windmills. They used our data when they were getting ready to install the Hull 2 windmill to make sure they installed the best, most efficient unit. And they used Blue Hills wind data to help them do that. So in other words, if we understand the direction of the wind or uh, the velocity of the wind, they could figure out where is the best place to um, install this yep, windmill? They, exactly. They were able to use the data from Blue Hill to predict the best size wind turbine to install, best location mm -hmm. to install it. And um, we don't have to worry a lot about direction with turbines because they face whatever direction the wind is coming from. But they wanted to make sure that they didn't put it in a spot. For example, the primary wind is from the west. They didn't want to put it where uh, the west wind would be blocked by a large mm. object like a skyscraper or anything like that. So can you tell us about um, your staff? and what the jobs are, are at the observatory. So the most important person that works at the observatory is our observer, and they are here every single day. They have to be here before 7 a.m., and they are always working on two days of data in addition to compiling the monthly, seasonal, and annual data. So they're always working on the data from yesterday, from midnight the night before to midnight last night. They're working on 7 a.m. yesterday morning through 7 a.m. today, and then they're working on 7 a.m. today through uh, 1 p.m. today. And the manual observations are crucial for that long-term climate study. Hmm. In addition to the observers, my job as program director is to educate the public about all the work that we do here, whether it's the meteorological observations, climatological observations, or some of the past work like the upper atmospheric studies with kites and balloons, and the rest of the history of the observatory. Are there certain programs you'd like to talk about um, to encourage more um participants? Sure. So one of the programs that relates specifically to uh, green activism and citizens is the Picture Post. It's a citizen science and we're very fortunate that the Yaki Foundation has given us a grant to bring it to um, hundreds of students in the area, in particular Boston and other underserved areas, uh, to learn about how you can participate yourself and that every citizen can contribute to the professional world of science. Picture Post has um, a literal post in the ground where you take nine pictures, one for each cardinal direction, north, northeast, east, south, etc., and then one of the sky above, and you upload them to the Picture Post website, and then scientists can look at the vegetation in the photographs and they can analyze things like when do the buds first start to go expand? And when do the leaves first start to emerge? And when do they come out full size? And when do they change from that rich spring green to their muted summer green? Oh. And when do they lose their chlorophyll and start changing their color? And by analyzing all of that phenological data, you can study the change in climate. And everyone who contributes by taking those nine pictures and uploading them to the website, the more data, the more science can be done. That's great. Don, is it possible to see one of the um, picture posts? Absolutely. We can even do a quick demonstration of how it's done. Okay, let's do that. All right, so the way it works is there's this little octagon here, and it's uh, set up to face the proper direction. You start with north, and you just take the picture, and you work your way around eight different directions. And The pictures overlap a little bit with the results of most cell phones. You can do it with any type of digital camera. If you have a cell phone, in addition to your eight directions, you take one in the sky. And you log on to picturepost.ou.edu. Register once, and then it's very easy to upload your pictures and then take your photos as often as you can and upload them as frequently as possible um, to the website. And you'll see that we are very fortunate to have a photographer from Norwood, Mass, named Craig Austin, who takes pictures here every single week and has been doing so since 2013. 
So we have hundreds of pictures from the three picture posts that are here at Blue Hill. This is called uh, Blue Hill West. The observatory tower is uh, the world's largest picture post. Each crenellation in the tower has picture post mount uh, in it. And then on the east side of the observatory, there's another one. So we can have the most complete um, idea of the foliage um, on Blue Hill. So I have a question. So that's the only spot you take it from? Just, just so here. The west one. And, and we do nine pictures here. Then we also have the observatory tower, nine pictures from the observatory tower, and then nine pictures from the post that's east of the observatory. So there's three, like, fixed um, spots that we take the pictures. Right. And most places only have one. For example, Moose Hill Sanctuary has one. Uh, we are a very unique location that has three so close to each other. And we did that intentionally because the forest on this side of the observatory kind of different from the forest on the east side of the observatory and then the observatory itself is able to look way out and see the entire region really well uh, which is a very unique uh, picture post most only see the immediate area are uh, the individual photos because you you said you take eight it's not like a video it's actually still photos they They're take still photos okay yep each one individually uh, because somebody might want to specifically monitor that linear juniper tree, for example, and seeing how fast it grows and how it changes. And another person specifically wants to research the pear tree. And in mm. fact, Craig, in addition to taking the photographs from this, he takes close-up of that pear tree so that we can really keep track of the flowering of the trees mm. and the other phenological changes of the tree and the health of the tree. What have you learned from taking these photos? One of the most valuable things is to see the impacts of things like drought. And because we have all the um, empirical data from the Weather Observatory, we can really see and understand that, oh, the trees really suffer from the drought. And one of the things that happened in 2022 is we finally got rain in September. And we were actually able to see things suddenly become green after being really, really, really brown. Um, and so to have the phenological data from all of these photographs combined with the empirical data from all the tools that we have measuring the different parameters of precipitation, wind speed, wind direction, temperature, and humidity, they're able to really get a better understanding of the total environment. John, I see uh, that there's some construction going on with the building. How old is it and what is happening now? So the original building was built in 1885 and then it was added on to three times. The first change happened in 1889 when the east wing was added. In 1902, the west wing, which is right over here, was okay. added. And then the final change happened in 1908 when they tore down the original two-story stone tower and replaced it with this three-story concrete tower that's here. So at 114 years old, the concrete, especially on the very top, is starting to crumble a bit. And we are very fortunate that the DCR appreciates the value of this National Historic Landmark. And so they're doing a major renovation to restore and renovate the entire building. The masonry on the stonework has all been repointed. The very, very top of the tower has been replaced with a new crenellation and um, parapet that looks exactly the same as the one from 1908. And the building is super watertight now, mm. so that it will last for another 114 years, or hopefully even longer than that. So I know that you have tours and programs going on, lots of activity, and right now the building is closed. When will the building reopen? So we hope to be open by June of 2023 at the latest. If we're lucky, we'll be opening in May. We do have outside programs that we offer now for people who want to tour around the outside, similar to our walk around today. And uh, we also do outreach programs where we go to schools and libraries and senior centers and we'll do different presentations on the climatology of the observatory or the history of the observatory or you can even learn how to build your own kite and go out and fly a kite as one of our many educational programs that we offer. So where can people learn more about the observatory? Sure, so we have a very nice website, bluehill.org, and we also have Facebook, Twitter, and um, YouTube. You can see some nice videos. We've had several webinars, and the, some of our webinars are on our YouTube channel, and uh, some nice short history videos on the YouTube channel as well. 
And so follow us on social media and look at bluehill.org. Okay, thank you. So I am encouraging everyone to come here, enjoy what's outside. It's just beautiful. The trees, the, um, the sky, the smell of the clean air. It's so worth coming here. And also, I also want to uh, let you know that we have a Facebook page for Walpole Green. Please look at it because we have a lot of information and we are looking for new members. Thank you all for watching and goodbye.